And then I want to move on to the passage that Ross would have given me if he'd been choosing. <laughs> okay, I wasn't actually intending to take this passage <coughs> until we went to Discovery last week, and Joyce was speaking at Discovery, and this was the children's address. Now, anyone from Discovery is watching this? Hello. Um, but I was like, it was the most unusual story to choose for a children's address, I thought. But then I thought, we should be dealing with all of the unusual stories. There aren't pieces of scripture that we should be kind of avoiding. And, uh, and then I got into this story and I couldn't let it go. So it, I'm going to read it. Um, but before I do, I want to show it in context. Some of you have seen me do this before, but I feel like so often we take the Old Testament and we don't know where the story fits. So a very quick Old Testament. You had the creation, the fall, the flood, um, and then you had the Tower of Babel and uh, dissemination of peoples and languages, and that takes you through Genesis 1 to 11. Then you have Abraham, followed by Isaac, followed by Jacob, and Abraham was called by God and had heard the voice of God. Jacob had 12 sons, one of whom Joseph was taken into slavery, eventually followed by the rest of the family, once Joseph had become um, senior. In the, in the house of Pharaoh, but you also, after that, found the people of God taken into slavery, and there were two to three million slaves. Now, along comes Moses saying, let my people go, um, from the word of the Lord, spoken to him, and then they wandered around in the desert before they got to the land of Canaan, and it wasn't Moses, because Moses got it wrong, um, Joshua was the one to lead them into the promised land. And that takes us through Genesis, the rest of Genesis, Job, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Joshua. They followed that, there was a time of the judges, and they got it right, they got it wrong, they got it, they said sorry, they tried to get it right again, and they got it wrong again. And they, they went through this cycle as a people of getting it wrong. And that takes you Ruth and Judges, the book of Judges. Then you've got the prophet Samuel, uh, the boy Samuel, hearing the voice of God. Um, and then he anointed the King Saul. Now King Saul was a man um, whose heart was not for God. And so you see the little heart crossed out there. But he was the king, first king of Israel, of the people, and that takes us through 1 Samuel, that's about 94 years. Then you've got David, and he had a whole heart for God, a man after God's own heart. Didn't mean he was sinless, but he didn't turn from God. And he didn't mess with his belief in God by mixing it with anybody else. Um, Solomon, on the other hand, had a divided heart. And that whole era was called the United Kingdom, not the, not the one that Boris Johnson is Prime Minister of, but um, these are the kings of the United Kingdom. And that takes you through First and Second Chronicles, Second Samuel, First Kings, um, many of the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Solomon. So that's that section of the Bible. Then moving on, uh, you have the, 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 the land is divided up among all the different tribes of Israel. And eventually, there is a split. And um, it was actually over not wanting to pay too much tax. Be careful. Tax. <laughs> um, the group that didn't want to pay taxes, they, got, they, 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 didn't, they didn't end up well. I'm not saying it's because of the taxes, but they didn't. But um, there was a split in the kingdom, and Rehoboam stayed with Judah and Benjamin and, and, and Levi, and then the ten tribes of Israel. It's funny, there's ten tribes of Israel, but then there's three others. It, the numbers don't totally match up because they didn't totally divide along the lines of the tribes. Anyway, the northern tribes became known as the tribes of Israel, and they were ruled by Jeroboam, and Jeroboam is who features in our story today. And they are what we call the lost tribes of Israel now, because eventually they got taken. So there were 19 kings and they were all bad. And that was the northern kingdom known as Israel. It lasted for 209 years. Then you have the southern kingdom, um, known as Judah. And it's from Judah you get the word Jew, because the, Jew, the, the southern kingdom was taken off to Babylon, and that's where synagogue worship started, they became known as Jews. Uh, there are 19 kings, good and bad, and one queen, bad. That doesn't imply that if you have a queen, it will necessarily mean it's a bad queen. Uh, let's have a look at how many bad kings they had. So that's 345 years of the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was taken off to Assyria, and the Babylonians took the southern kingdom off to 
Babylon and we get by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept as they longed to go home. So that takes you through 2 Chronicles 10 to 36, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and then all of these prophets are all in this era. Now, you have two prophets in, in to the exiles in Babylon, that's Ezekiel and Daniel, and that was a prophecy to the to the captives. Now the Jews begin to return in 538 BC. Um, you've got Queen Esther in Persia. She was part of making that possible. She was there for a time such as this. Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple. Israel rebuilt the hearts of the people. And Nehemiah rebuilt the wall. And you've got Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah, Malachi, Haggai, and Zechariah. And that brings you right to the end of the Old Testament. So that's the whole of the Old Testament. And our story today, and I'm basically just to say that the people sort of were whittled down into a faithful remnant. But our story today appears here. When Jeroboam was king, the kingdom had just split and he was the king. And they were... Um, yeah, this, this is the division of the people of God. And some questions when you come to an Old Testament text, this is something I like to do. What kind of literature are we reading? And in this one we're reading history. Um, it's not poetry, it's not prophecy. There's prophecy within the story, but it's predominantly history. What's the background of the story? Well, you got that. What's the story about? We'll get there. What do we learn about God dealing with humanity? Hopefully we'll get there too. Uh, what do we learn about God's universal plan? And what does it mean for us now? So those are just some questions as we approach the passage. Now I'm gonna read. It is a story, so feel free to just sit and listen to a story. Um, and, uh, but I will put the words up if you prefer that. So, By the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel, as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. He cried out against the altar, this man of God, um, by the word of the Lord. O altar, altar, this is what the Lord said. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you... He will make sacrifices, the priests of the high places who now make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. That same day the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart, and the ashes on it will be poured out. Oh, sorry. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar of Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Seize him! But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so they couldn't put it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out and according to the sign given to the man of God by the word of the Lord. Then the king said to the man of God, Intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord, and the king's hand was restored, and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, Come home with me, and have something to eat, and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king, Even if, I, even if you were to give me half your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread and, or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread and, or drink water or return by the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. Now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel, whose sons came to him and told him all that the man of God had done there, uh, there that day. They also told their father what he had said to the king. Their father asked them, which way did he go? And his son showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. And when he had saddled the donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I have been told by the word of the Lord, 
you must not eat bread or drink water there, or return by the way you came. The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet, as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, Bring him back with you to your house, so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. While they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah, This is what the Lord says, You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore your body will not be buried in the tomb of your fathers. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. As he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was thrown down on the road, with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. Some people who passed by saw the body thrown down there, with the lion standing beside the body, and they went and reported it in the city where the old prophet lived. Where the old prophet lived. When the prophet who had brought him back from his journey heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who defied the word of the Lord. The Lord has given him over to the lion, which has mauled him and killed him, as the word of the Lord had warned him. The prophet said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. And they did so. Then he went out and found the body thrown down on the road, with the donkey and the lion standing beside it. The lion had neither eaten the body nor mauled the donkey. So the prophet picked up the body of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back to his own city to mourn for him and bury him. Then he laid the body in his own tomb, and they mourned over him and said, O oh, my brother. After burying him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the message he declared by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on the high places in the towns of Samaria will certainly come true. Even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once again, once more, appointed priests for the high places from all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the high places. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth. Amen. So it's kind of a significant passage when you sort of think this is actually pointing out this is why the house of Jeroboam fell. This is why um, uh, the, the destruction from the face of the earth. I mean, there's lots of theories about the lost tribes of Israel. To be quite honest, we've got such a global mixed gene pool, it's impossible really to tease out. Um, and if anyone's doing the ancestry DNA, anyone here done ancestry DNA? Yep. Were you a hybrid mix of things? Yep. We're all turning into mongrels, basically. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember as a kid, they always said, don't buy a pedigree. They've all got all sorts of problems. Buy a mongrel, they're much healthier. Um, <laughs> So we're turning into mongrels, and that's okay. That is okay. We're, we're children, sons and daughters of God. Uh, we're children of God. That's that's our that's our fano. Our fano is under the headship of Christ, and that's who we are. Um, I did forget to keep going on with this, as you as you noticed, but I didn't. So we will finish off the scripture passage, and we got to the end. So Jeroboam, that's his name in Hebrew for those that are interested, um, he fled to Egypt um, when discovered as conspiring against the unity of the kingdom. So this man was conspiring against that united kingdom. Um, I don't know, we've got um, Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland, maybe she's the same at the moment. She's conspiring against the united kingdom, wanting an independent Scotland. He did return when Solomon died. And he demanded Rehoboam reduce taxes, and when he didn't, he withdrew. That's when it separated uh, with the ten northern tribes. 
He reigned for 22 years um, in what became known as the Northern Kingdom or Israel. Now this is key. He built two temples with golden calves in Bethel and Dan. You, you saw in that little chart I did at the start who had a divided heart, who had a whole heart, and who had no heart. But David wasn't perfect. David was described as a man after God's own heart. He had a and yet, look what he did with Bathsheba. Look what he did to Bathsheba's husband. This was not a perfect man. This is a man that sinned, grievously sinned. But what he didn't do is worship other gods. And that was, that was key. Um, and, and reading through scripture, it sort of comes really clear in the Old Testament that God is cleaving out a people for himself. There is only one God. When you start mixing that, you're in trouble. And you will be in trouble, and your relationship with God is in deep trouble. It is not. This, it's not even like oil and water. This is, this is like granite and water. You cannot mix them. And, and if you try to mix them, you have lost. You have lost your bearings. And, and um, Jeroboam had completely lost his bearings by building these, um, these temples for the golden calves. And it's here that the, the man of God turns up. Now we don't quite know, oh yeah, I just want to show you this. So there's Jeroboam, and the, this is the lineage for the um, northern tribes, the leaders of the northern tribes. And this is the lineage for the southern tribes of Judah. So in this, you've got Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the two leaders, but down here, Way on down, about 300 years later, is Josiah, who the, the man of God was talking about. It took a while to happen, but it came. The prophecy came true. So the man of God, he could be Ido, is the, is the best identity I could get for him from different commentaries. Um, a prophet from the time of Solomon. Could be. Nothing definitive on the name and identity of the man of God. He was identified as, as such as early as the first century, so it's not a new thing. He was chosen by God. Um, he was chosen by God, not the old prophet in Bethel. So when God wanted to speak to Jeroboam, have a look who he chose. He didn't choose the man just sitting there, right in Bethel. The man with the donkey and the sons who kept loading up the donkey. The donkey really played a big part in the story. Um, but God brought a man a man faithful to him, who heard from him. The old prophet, now the old prophet lied, and it's not actually clear why. Why did he lie? I want to hang out with the prophet. I want to hang out with this man of God. I want to spend time with him. Um, it, it's quite a confused picture what the old prophet is doing. But he deliberately lied. He deliberately deceived. And he brought real confusion into that situation. He misused the name of the Lord. Now, some of you might be um, weekend warriors who do projects at the weekend. And at times you might be hammering something and you hit your thumb. And a word might come out that's not good. Right? And it might come out and you might actually find yourself using the name of the Lord in that situation. I would say, yes, you've got to say, forgive me, God, I did not mean to say that. All right, forgive me for doing that. But the depth of the misuse of the name of the Lord that's in the commandments is much, much, much deeper than what you say when you hit your thumb with a hammer. It's what actually you do in the name of the Lord, what you cause to happen, how you coerce or manipulate situations. And what the Pharisees were doing in the name of the Lord and what this old man did in the name of the Lord was deeply offensive to God. Having said which, he wasn't the one that got eaten by a lion. It was actually the man of God. And it seems like one of those rough justice things. And I don't know about you, I've heard lots of people say about Moses, that was a bit rough justice really. After all that Moses had done, after everything he'd been through, and bringing the people out of their bondage, out of slavery, for hitting the rock in a bad temper? Really? That, that was it? 
after everything he'd done. But actually, I, I see a, a parallel between this, this man of God and Moses. Moses' sin, and this was something I looked into years ago and did a lot of um, study on this, because why was it so bad? Moses said, must we provide for you water from the rock? Not must he, but must we. And it's the Nazi, not Yahtzee. That was the title of my essay on this one. Moses was losing sight of the provider. He was losing sight of the provider. And as the leader of the community, if he's lost sight of where all comes from, where life and sustenance and provision and guidance, if he's losing sight of that as the leader, then he is going to get the people completely lost. And they are about to establish a new kingdom, a new era, not a new kingdom, a new era by entering into the land of Canaan. This was going to be a, 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 just a, such an amazing era for them as they crossed over the Jordan and took the land of Canaan. If they were to go in there thinking, Moses is the one who gets us what we need, Moses is the one who strikes the rock and gets us water. If they'd grown so dependent on him as a leader and thought he was the source, then they were going to very quickly fall apart. They needed to know that God is the source. We have a um, we have a danger um, we have a danger in society of putting leaders up and up and up, and the more we do that. We make them very vulnerable to temptation. We make them very vulnerable because we're not holding them to account. And we should hold our leaders to account. Our leaders should be looking to the word of God, or the Christian leaders should be. And we should be asking them hard questions. We have all sort of grieved, I am sure, this season with Rabbi Zacharias and what's happened there. But when you left someone so high, that the people closest actually know what's going on and don't hold them to account, then we have a problem. Leadership is under God and leadership should point to God. And, and we are all, we are all, um, we are all going through one intercessor and that is Jesus Christ. We do not need a second intercessor. There is one intercessor between man and God, and that is the person of Christ, uh, the, the, the Son of God. So this, this man of God here, he had been told by God, now, he doesn't have the Bible to reference what's right and what's wrong. And that's something I think is always good to remember about our Old Testament stories. They really do depend on that revelation in a way that they, they don't have scriptures to compare it with. But he had been given very clear revelation from God on what to do. And then he got duped. And then he got tricked. He got tricked because somebody told him something that sounded good. It sounded right. But it wasn't of God. He knew what was of God. And yet he got duped. And I think... Um, I think the lesson here, I look at this man and I think, well, why? Why did he need to get mauled by a lion and killed? And the lion and the donkey stood by. And the lion wasn't even interested in eating the donkey or anybody else who went past. It was the man of God who got eaten, who got killed. Well, he, he didn't get eaten, he got killed, but not eaten. Why? Well, if that man who was a, an appointed prophet of God went back to the people, because he had come from the other kingdom, remember, he had come from the other side. If he went back and he was a designated prophet of God, but he was so easily duped and was willing to let go of what God had given him and had told him, that was leaving the people vulnerable, in the same way that they would have been vulnerable under Moses. Under Moses they'd be very, very vulnerable, because as soon as Moses dies, then there's this whole fraction of uh, fracture in the people. So I feel in some ways that this man 
God, God is completely just and we will understand these things fully one day. At the moment, I'm straining through a dark glass dimly to try and get a hold of this. And I acknowledge that. But as I strain through the dark glass dimly, I feel like God holds worship of himself very precious. He doesn't want that mixed and he doesn't want that confused. And he, he holds the devotion of his people and their journey very precious to him. So this man going back who was unstable to some degree and wasn't able to hold on and actually gave in and went for lunch, that, that, that's, that was actually important. Because God wants a prophet who will hold on faithfully to the word of God uh, and, and not be duplicitous, not be double-minded. So the prophecy comes true. And later on in 2 Kings, it says, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made, who made Israel sin, had made both that altar and the high place he broke down. And he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. As Josiah turned, so this was Josiah that was spoken of, he was the one right down at the end of the genealogy. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were on the, there on the mountain. And he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed. Who proclaimed these words? Who proclaimed these words? Then he said, What gravestone is this that I see? So the men of the city told him, It is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. But the, um, so basically that all came to pass. Sorry, I'll come back, I'll come back to that one in a moment. So it all came to pass, and it was dealt with. I've been, I've been just to say yesterday, I've spent yesterday in, in this, uh, reading this book. I don't know if anyone's read this one, Tefiti Oronomai, and The Resistance of Parihaka. Um, incredibly important event, I think, from my point of view. I'm a, I'm a foreigner in a strange land, but in this strange land, I think, Seeing what happened to Parihaka, I want to dig into it. I want to understand more of it. I feel like the more I read, the less I, I really understand it. I want to understand what was going on in the hearts, particularly of Tukiti Oromamai and uh, Tohukake, the, the, these two men. Um, and the more I look into it, the more I hear prophecies around the place and realize that prophecy needs to be tested as from God all the time. And there are amazing uh, prophecies spoken, and there are distracting and awful prophecies spoken. Um, and this is this is something that um, has come up for us in the last year. Um, there were a group of over a hundred prophets who prophesied that that um, Donald Trump would be in for a second term. This is no small thing, and this isn't, this isn't all about politics. This is the church of God using the name of God to say what's going to happen, and it didn't happen. That's important. It's important... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure the wrong thing. Uh, sorry. Uh, a second. Can I get that over there? Yeah. So this man, Jeremiah Johnson, has actually apologized for what he did and is getting roasted for doing so. He actually said, I got it wrong. And for saying he got it wrong, um, he's getting a, a lot of heat. <laughs> now, the, these prophecies, they... <coughs> They have an impact on the reputation of the church. They have a deep impact on the reputation of the church and we should be very concerned about that. We should be concerned about it in our own lives. When people speak prophecy over us, test it. Test it. Make sure God is not going to contradict himself. God is not a God who contradicts himself. So we need to test whatever is coming our way. 
And um, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, it says, But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, a word which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how will we recognize the word which the Lord has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the thing does not happen or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You're not to be afraid of him. Now, I don't know if you know my oldest son. Some of you do. We're in big heavy chats at the moment <laughs> about the prophet as a role or prophecy as spoken from God? Is there a role and an appointment as a prophet? And what does it mean? Where's the accountability? How do you wrap around that? So these are, these are late night big conversations we're having. But one thing we're not disagreeing on, prophecy should be consistent with God. It should be true. And according to that, if someone has spoken prophecy and it did not come true, they have spoken presumptuously and they are not to be regarded after that. Now that's a very hard word. In the middle of the frenzy that is, is, is the US, and the US, for some reason, has this massive impact on our communications and media, when really it's, it's not as big as it looks on the map, actually. The maps are all stretched and they look bigger. Um, and that's a whole other story. But. What's coming out of there impacts the world in a way that is so, it's so, it's in some ways disturbing. We need to keep an eye on that. And we need to be careful how that's impacting the global church. But the role of prophecy is that the prophecy must come from God and it must be true. So here's a few applications. God does not contradict himself. Simple. So you've got something to test it with. Abraham didn't have anything, to be quite honest. Abraham was hearing voices, and he followed those voices. We've actually got a lot here that we can test against whatever comes our way. And God does not contradict himself. We need to discern false prophecy, and then not trust that prophet again. They have spoken in the name of the Lord that which wasn't given to them. Sinners are so often prepared to believe some old stranger telling tales rather than hold on to the Lord. Be careful. All of us need to be careful that we're not just hanging on the next buzz tale and the next exciting story. The unfaithful prophet was allowed to live out his days. The man of God was held accountable. You can't unknow. And what I mean by that is the man of God knew what God had said to him. And he didn't do what God had said to him. The old man, the old man didn't know necessarily. But then God spoke through him. Another difficult part of the story. But the, you can't unknow. What has God said to you? What has God revealed to you? God has revealed so clearly. The Lord is one. And he will be worshipped and him alone. Not mixed with other gods, not mixed with other philosophies and strange things. Be careful what's trying to mix with your, your Christian faith. Because in this day and age, there's a lot of things trying to dilute your walk with God. Hold on to your walk with God. Hold it as precious. Hold his name as precious. Hold your devotion to him as life-giving. And anything that wants to dilute it is wanting to dilute that life-giving part of your life. So, yeah, may we be faithful to what God has given us to do. We've only got a little blip. There's a, um, a Garth Brooks song, if anybody ever listens to Garth Brooks. Good old country and western, but you don't hear much of him nowadays because he doesn't put his music on Spotify or Apple. Um, he's raging against the system. I'm not sure he's winning, but he's raging against the system. But he talks about, there, uh, on a gravestone, there's two dates, and between the two dates, there's a little dash. And it's the little dash that is all important. What do we do with the little dash between the day we're born and the day we pass away? Let's make it a wholehearted walk with God. Let's not be Saul. Let's not be Solomon. And yeah, you're going to get it wrong. 
David had a whole heart for God. He repented and turned back to God and, and, and confessed his sin. And God restored him. But he didn't rebel against his God. Let's pray. Our Lord and our Father, we acknowledge your name. We acknowledge one Savior. We acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for your life given for us. Your life poured out, your life blood poured out, that we might have salvation. And there is salvation in no other. Lord, as we as we move in our society here or even as we move globally in sharing the gospel around the world, help us to have clear minds and whole hearts to honour you and to walk faithfully, faithfully with you. Lord, we look forward to the day when the dark glass is moved away and we see all things clearly. We look forward to our worship around the throne of the Lamb where peoples of every tribe, nation and tongue will worship you. There'll be no confusion then. There'll be no blurring of who is Lord and who is to be honoured. And boy, we look forward to that day. Lead us forward, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Mm -hmm. <coughs>